Good evening. My name is Thomas Meal, and I am a Kevin B. Harrington student ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin this evening's program, I would just like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other devices that make noise. Today's speaker is Dr. Alan Curtis, the President and CEO of the Eisenhower Foundation in Washington, D.C. Dr. Curtis was a member of the Kerner Commission in 1968 and gained notoriety while on the commission for declaring that America was heading toward, quote, two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Mr. Curtis recently authored a book with Fred Harris titled Healing Our Divided Society, where they dis dissect the lack of progress made in the United States to reduce poverty, inequality, and racial justice. Dr. Curtis served as the executive director of President Jimmy Carter's interagency urban policy group and as urban policy advisor to Housing and Urban Development Secretary Patricia Roberts Harris. He also served on President Lyndon B. Johnson's National Commission on the Causes and Prevention of Violence, which was formed in the aftermath of the assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. The topic of tonight's presentation is Healing Our Divided Society, Reducing Poverty, Inequality, and Racial Justice. Following Dr. Curtis's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Please use one of the microphones to ask your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Alan Curtis. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, it's opening day, and I promise to try not to speak too long, so those of you who want to uh, can get back to see the Red Sox play the Mariners tonight. Um, in uh, 1964, at uh, about this time of year, um, I was in college uh, starting to get a little worried about finals, and uh, trying to line up a summer job back home in Wisconsin. Uh, I landed employment at $200 a month uh, as deputy director for voter registration um, for the Democratic Party in Milwaukee. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was running against Barry Goldwater for, for president, and Goldwater had these really cool bumper stickers, AUH2O chemical formula for gold water. Um, I got my, my brother Jeff, who's 12 I think, and his best friend Gordy to uh, paste LBJ stickers over the AUH2O stickers at shopping centers around the city. Uh, I was really contributing to the delinquency of minors, uh, but we called it uh, reframing the debate. Uh, because of uh, my brother and his best friend, Gordy, LBJ won. Um, but soon the, uh, the urban protests of the 1960s began in cities like Detroit, Newark, and over 100 other, 150 other cities around the country. And in response, President Johnson, um, as we've heard, uh, formed the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorder called the Kerner Commission after the governor of uh, of Illinois, who was the chairman. Uh, the Kerner Commission issued its report uh, early in 1968, and that was really a terrible year, the most terrible year in my professional life. Uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy endorsed the Kerner Commission's findings in the early part of the year. Uh, Dr. King was assassinated in April, Senator Kennedy was assassinated in June. 
the Chicago police beat up anti-war protesters at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And the nation finally in November elected a, a president who ignored the vision of the Kerner Commission. Uh, most of the Kerner commissioners uh, were white men who carried the imprimatur of the political establishment. And none, nonetheless, as we've heard, the commission concluded uh, that America was heading towards two societies, black and white, separate and unequal, and concluded that uh, we had made very little progress in reducing poverty and equality and racial injustice. Uh, so 50 years later, in 2018, our foundation, the Eisenhower Foundation, released uh, its update of the Kerner Commission. And we concluded that America still has a long uh, way to go in reducing poverty, inequality, and racial injustice but that in, in the interim, at least we've learned something, uh, some evidence about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the 50-year update is called, as you can see, Healing Our Divided Society, and we had a national advisory uh, panel of, of, of distinguished Americans like uh, uh, civil rights icon Marion Wright Aylman and Nobel laureate uh, in economics Joseph Stiglitz uh, as part of our our uh, contributors. Uh, if you talk to me today uh, afterwards, I, I'd be happy to uh, send you a copy of, of, of the report. Um, and also we have uh, the New York Times op-ed we wrote, which is a good executive summary if you're interested. Uh, in our time together th this uh, evening, uh, I would really like to, to share with you some of our recommendations uh, and then challenge you to partner with us uh, as the nation heads towards 2020. But first, uh, a little bit of history. I want to show you uh, CBS coverage of our 25th anniversary update of the Kerner Commission in 1993 and ask you if things have changed much since then. Good morning, I'm Charles Terrault, and this is Sunday Morning. Nearly 50 years ago, Norman Corwin wrote, Brotherhood is not so wild a dream as those who profit by postponing it pretend. Brotherhood is not so wild a dream, but we keep postponing it, even in America, where we should know better by now. Out of the Ashes is our cover story this morning, to be reported by Tarrant Smith. 25 years ago, in the wake of riots here in Los Angeles and around the country, the Kerner Commission on Civil Disorders warned that the nation was swiftly becoming what it called two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. Today, a follow-up report released just this morning finds, sadly, that that prediction largely has come true. This Sunday morning, we'll take a look at the problems of America's inner cities and as some of the strikingly successful programs that offer hope in the place of despair. Out of the Ashes is our cover story this morning. It deals with race, the old American dilemma, and it is based on a new report to the nation, which you will be reading in tomorrow morning's newspapers. A similar report came out 25 years ago. It was much discussed at the time and little acted upon. So in many respects, things are no better today. They are worse. Tom Smith reports our Sunday morning cover story. <laughs> this was once in 1965. Get your hands up. This was Detroit. summer of 67 in Washington, D.C. in 68. The American people are deeply disturbed. They are baffled and dismayed by the wholesale looting and violence that has occurred both in small towns and in great metropolitan centers. Why did it happen? What can be done to prevent it from happening again and again? 25 years ago tomorrow, the Kerner Commission on Civil Disorders issued its famous report on the urban riots of the 1960s. 
That night, the late Harry Reisman reported the findings on CBS. Our nation, says the report, is moving toward two separate societies, black and white, separate but unequal. If the division is allowed to widen, it says, we will find ourselves living in a state of tension and lawlessness held in check only by repression. And this was Los Angeles just last spring, a violent reminder of the commission's warning. Generally, all the conditions in the inner city have gotten worse. Lynn Curtis, president of the Milton Eisenhower Foundation, is the author of a major new report released this morning that updates the original findings. Everything essentially has gotten worse. So today, we ask the same question. I can say that in 25 years from now, um, we will still be having riots. Crime rates will have increased. We will be still doubling our prison population every 10 years. The report focuses on the missed opportunities of the last 25 years and stresses that the same conditions that provoked the riots in the 1960s led to the violence here in South Central Los Angeles last year. You know, it's a pretty accurate report. Danny Bakewell heads the Brotherhood Crusade, a black self-help organization that has been working to improve economic conditions in South Central Los Angeles for 25 years. The reality is, if we don't correct this problem, it's going to happen. But if it's not in Los Angeles, it's going to be in Detroit. It's going to be in Chicago. It's going to be in New York. It's going to be in New Orleans. Because of the circumstances that exist for African Americans throughout this country is the same. It's second best. It's always short end of the stick. We're heading in a very ugly direction. Historian and civil rights advocate Roger Wilkins has watched the city's deteriorate. Democracy presumes grown-up, responsible people who will face their problems. In the issue of race, Americans won't do that. We're still in deep denial. The statistics contained in this report are staggering. 33% of inner-city blacks live in poverty. 60% of their children are born into fatherless families. One in four young black males is either in jail or under arrest. But the report insists proven solutions exist to all these problems. We're saying that we have the resources to do this if we want to, that we have the political will, that what we need to do is replicate what works on a larger scale, like Head Start, toss out what doesn't work. The report cites Head Start as a model, as the nation's most successful program to help the inner cities. It feeds and teaches 700,000 preschool kids nationwide. But Head Start has never been fully funded, and only a quarter of all the eligible lower-income children are enrolled. For every dollar invested in Head Start, you get five bucks in benefits, less crime, less drugs, less school dropouts, less welfare dependence. It makes economic sense. But Head Start is not enough. The report stresses that to be effective, similar support systems need to be extended to school children, teenagers, and young adults. In South Central Los Angeles, kids pour in after school at Lou Danzler's Challengers Boys and Girls Club. The club sends buses to the schools to make sure that the kids get there safe. It's safe, it's secure, kids feel like this is theirs. It's like an oasis. We call it the oasis of South Central Los Angeles. All right, see how we have QRST. Tutors conduct after-school classes here in computer skills and make sure that homework gets done. It's a simple formula and an effective one. It's true. You don't have to have a master or a PhD in order to understand what goes on around here. I mean, you gotta have a commitment, you gotta care. I mean, those things are so simple. You gotta have love, you gotta have discipline, you gotta set standards. Lynn Curtis. Well, we had 100 boys and girls clubs of that nature in that part of Los Angeles. We'd be cooking, we'd be, we'd be doing something based on what works. This is a class about life, brothers. This is a class about life. 
working, choosing a career is life. If you want to be in this class, you want this career, you got to discipline this. For inner city youths who drop out of school, the report says, programs like Youth Build USA have already been proven to work. In Boston, Youth Build teaches math and basic architecture, helps students pass their high school equivalency exams, and gets them jobs in the construction trades. In the process, inner city housing gets rehabilitated. Young people want to do something that's permanent and visible and that they can show to their grandchildren. Dorothy Stoneman founded Youthville 15 years ago in New York's East Harlem. Things work. Programs work. Comprehensive programs run by young people in partnership with adults, rebuilding their own community and their own lives, work. They have to be funded. Funding is the key, the report says and funding on a scale equal to the dimension of the problem. After the Los Angeles riots, President Bush promised billions in inner city aid, but the day after the election, vetoed the bill. The report estimates that at least $30 billion a year for the next 10 years will be required to do the job. That money, the report recommends, should be used to create multi-purpose urban rescue programs like the Argus community in the South Bronx. My favorite thing to do this morning is find a job. Argus takes drug and alcohol abusers off the streets and teaches them discipline and the basic skills they need to get jobs. It also serves high school dropouts, pregnant women, and people with AIDS. Has helped Fernando Gonzalez stay off drugs and find a career. He's now trained to be a chef at a New York culinary school. Now I see myself as um, learning the most I can from the school so it can help me um, go into the cooking field. Of course, uh, not everybody starts on the top. You have to work your way up. You know, but at least I can see myself working at least as a head cook, making a little extra money than what I, you know, than what I was making in the past. The report says the problems of the cities have grown progressively more acute over the last 25 years, and that time is running out. Brotherhood Crusades, Danny Bakewell. The basic reality is that people living in America today, African Americans, young warrior types, strong, able-bodied black men, are saying no longer are they going to sit by and watch white folk enjoy the fruits of this society while they are relegated to a position of not even being able to provide food, clothing, and shelter for their families. That's not going to exist anymore. Roger Wilkins. If we continue to ignore these problems, things will get worse for everybody. We will dilute our democracy, and we will dilute our standards of living. Um, we will have larger and larger groups of people who are not only not contributing, but who are actively destroyed. The report concludes that none of this has to happen. The solutions exist. No magic is required, other than the political will to finally do what the Kerner Commission said should have been started 25 years ago. Well, I've, uh, since then, I've stopped using my first name, Lynn, and started using my middle name, Alan. But I would suggest to you that uh, perhaps uh, not much else really has changed in those 25 years, and certainly over the 50 years. Um, of course, since the Kerner Commission, we've elected twice a, an African-American president. There's been a dramatic increase in the African-American and Latino middle classes and in the number of African-Americans and Latinos who are uh, elected officials. Uh, recent films like uh, The Hate You Give, Black Klansman, Black Panther, If Beale Street Could Talk, and Hidden Figures, all have in their own ways made important uh, 
cultural statements. Yet, I suggest to you that the reality is that James Baldwin communicated to Robert Kennedy that night in New York City many years ago continue to resonate. Neo-Nazis have made their statements in Charlottesville and in many other places. Black Lives Matter has revealed what Americans did not want to see in Ferguson and in many other places. The Kerner Commission criticized police and today zero tolerance policing against people of color has failed. Mass incarceration is the present iteration of slavery and Jim Crow. And I encourage you all to see the magnificent new legacy museum uh, on mass incarceration in Montgomery, Alabama. Sentencing laws remain racially biased today. About 200,000 people were in prison and jail in 1968, uh, especially thanks to the crime legislation of the 80s and 90s. Today, uh, the American prison industrial complex holds 2.2 million people, and they are disproportionately people of color. Nonetheless, the present homicide rate, reported homicide rate, is almost as high as when the Kerner Commission was writing its report in the 1960s. So you kind of wonder about policy if the homicide rate is about the same. In many ways, mass incarceration also has become a part of our housing policy for the poor. That housing policy has included conscious, purposeful, government-created segregation, as Richard Rothstein has eloquently documented in his new book, The Color of Law. Richard is going around the country speaking, as I am, um, ab about these issues. Public school segregation has increased since the Kerner Commission, beginning with the backward-looking policies of the 1980s. Overall, child poverty has increased since the Kerner Commission. Deep poverty, the poorest of the poor, has increased in part because of what the late journalist Molly Ivins accurately called the welfare deform of the 1990s, called TANF, uh, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, that welfare reform legislation has failed based on very uh, solid uh, evaluations over many years. The ratio of African American to white unemployment has remained two to one over all those 50 years. Income inequality and wealth inequality have dramatically increased over that time and were greatly accelerated by the supply side uh, induced uh, Great Recession of 2008. The speed at which the rich have been pulling away from the rest of us has accelerated since the Kerner Commission. Most of the economic gains from productivity over the, those years have gone to the wealthiest and to uh, corporate profits. In the 1950s, top uh, CEOs made about 20 times as much as their workers. Today, top CEOs make about 320 times as much as their workers. Slaves, of course, were not allowed labor unions, and today corporate America has attacked unions, even though a majority of Americans uh, is in favor of unions. Corporate financiers brought us the Great Recession of 2008, yet they have not been punished. They have not been adjudicated into the prison industrial complex, which, of course, is one source of their profits. In comparison to all other industrialized democracies, America has the highest rates of incarceration, the highest rates of homicide, and the highest rates of overall child poverty. Yet I suggest to you that none of this really has to be. To begin to heal our divided society, we need to ex accelerate the movement to base policy on evidence and not ideology. Only a very small percentage of all federal government programs is, is based on evidence. All that federal money and so little evidence. Same applies at the state and local level. What are just a, a few examples then of, of um, evidence-based policy that does in fact work? Uh, the Kerner Commission's recommendations gave priority to economic and education policy, so I'll talk about that a little. Uh, it means uh, for economic policy that uh, at, at least our conclusions are that we need Keynesian policy that carefully links uh, job creation to job placement and then to uh, 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 a process in which training comes first uh, 
before work, not training first, work first. Job placement needs to focus on rebuilding the nation's crumbling public infrastructure and on significantly expanding technologies to reverse climate change. The priority needs to be on public investing in poor, working, and middle-class Americans rather than relinquishing more power, still more power, to the rich. As Nobel Prize-winning economist Paul Krugman reminds us, a large majority of the American citizenry wants to see more investment in public infrastructure. The package of demand-side economic investments in average citizens that we advocate needs to include a higher minimum wage, more power to unions to better protect wage earners from the rich, trade policy that benefits workers, and single-payer health insurance for all. Such demand-side policy can both stimulate economic growth and reduce inequality. A carefully formulated environmental policy can both reverse climate change and reduce inequality. As Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, author Stephen Perlstein has reminded us, reducing inequality won't make us poor. The Scandinavian countries, for example, have much lower inequality than America, but per capita income levels that are about the same as ours. What does evidence-based policy mean in housing? We need to scale up the many successful models of housing integration. For example, in places like uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, near where I live in Washington, D.C. And housing integration also is an important path, of course, to neighborhood school integration. What evidence-based policy uh, do we need in education? Uh, we need school integration, as I've said, combined with much more equitable financing of public schools and greatly improved training of public school teachers. Here, the state of Connecticut provides a, a really great, solid uh, a model for replication. It is essential, I believe, to re that a return to public school integration incorporate a new curricula that instill a strong sense of identity and pride in students of color so that they can thrive in white space after graduation. What does evidence policy mean in criminal justice? Aware of the astronomical cost of prison buildings, state, states like California, New York, and New Jersey have reduced their prison populations by about 25% over recent years with no really discernible rise in, in crime, and we need to spread that policy across the country, I suggest. We also need to appoint to the Supreme Court opponents of mass incarceration, like Michelle Alexander, Sherilyn Eiffel, and Brian Stevenson. What evidence place-based policy can be targeted to specific geographic locations in truly disadvantaged neighborhoods? Uh, this is important, uh, given the interrelated problems uh, faced in such communities. Uh, it, it only really makes uh, common sense to uh, say that different policy needs to be co-targeted to those same neighborhoods. So uh, as I've advocated recently uh, uh, to the Major City Police Chiefs Association, and I did this a day after uh, President Trump addressed them, it was interesting. Uh, comparison and uh, presentations. Uh, uh, but as I advocated there, uh, in poor and working class neighborhoods around the country, we, we need a real community-based policing, not just uh, the rhetoric we often hear. Uh, such community policing needs to build on demonstrated successes in many diverse locations, from San Francisco to Puerto Rico to South Carolina. Uh, to right here in New Hampshire, uh, where we worked uh, with then Senator uh, Judge Gregg in, in Dover and several other cities. Uh, we, we showed in, in, in these demonstrations that community-based uh, nonprofit organizations can partner with carefully trained police officers to simultaneously mentor at-risk youth, reduce crime, reduce fear, and increase a sense of trust in the community. Such innovative community policing, we're arguing, uh, needs to be deployed to help stabilize neighborhoods uh, to encourage the kind of community-based banking 
uh, that was going very well before the re regressive federal policies of the 1980s. The Shore Bank experience in Chicago remains a prime model for scaling up. The community-based banking, in turn, should generate community economic development corporations like Bedford-Stuyvesant in the Bronx to uh, construct more affordable and integrated housing. The housing construction, in turn, should create jobs for community residents and for returning ex-offenders who benefit from evidence-based reintegration uh, models like the Minnesota Comprehensive Reentry Plan. Uh, the jobs, in turn, should be framed as youth development initiatives. The youth development should scale up evidence-based programs like Youth Bill that you saw on the uh, video, uh, My Brother's Keeper, and uh, our own uh, Quantum Opportunities uh, model, which uh, all of which involve mentoring, uh, life skills training, tutoring to uh, high school dropouts and uh, youth uh, at risk of dropping out. And that mentoring should be not only for high schoolers, but for middle schoolers, for uh, elementary schoolers, and uh, finally all uh, eligible children should receive uh, preschool. So in other words, evidence-based, place-based policy that works in truly disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, targets multiple solutions to multiple problems. Evidence-based policy is complementary and interdependent. It is not separate and unequal. The scaling up of what works needs to be financed in part by the scaling down of what doesn't work. What doesn't work includes multi-billion dollar trickle-down supply-side tax breaks for the rich, prison building at a massive level for the poor, zero-tolerance policing, supply-side vouchers, privatization of schools, and the temporary assistance for needy uh, families program that I mentioned earlier. Those are just some examples. In response to the failure of trickle-down supply-side economics, we need to increase taxes on very high incomes, as advised by Nobel laureate in economics Peter Diamond, but also by billionaire Warren Buffett. We need to return to the federal policies of the 1950s when top income tax rates on the rich during the Eisenhower administration were 70 to 80 percent, about twice as high as they are now. What doesn't work also includes excessive reliance on misleading catchphrases like voluntarism, empowerment, and self-sufficiency. What doesn't work includes global symposia at ostentatious resorts where so-called thought leaders talk down to us, avoid how to reduce inequality, avoid how to change fundamental power equations, and avoid how to reform the rules of the game. Instead, the current fashion is to recite ineffective corporate buzzwords like win-win, like market-driven solutions, and like social impact investing. Most of all, what doesn't work includes the false 1980s rhetoric on government being the problem. In fact, the problem is dishonest government and corporate greed. The solution is good government in partnership with, among other institutions, a well-managed and greatly expanded nonprofit sector. Through the scaling down of what doesn't work and the scaling up of what does work, an evidence-based Kerner strategy that sufficiently invests in human capital can reduce poverty, inequality, and racial injustice. Progress in achieving these Kerner goals can also increase American soft power globally. Such Kerner progress can communicate the importance of America to the world. Contrast can be made to the human rights atrocities committed by China and Russia in places like Tiananmen Square, Tibet, Muslim East Turkestan, and Syria. Americans can be reminded of how China is, committing, is committed to a long-run strategic campaign that propagandizes authoritarian values as superior to democratic values. To help counter that propaganda, my colleague Joe Stiglitz of Columbia and I have argued in our Kerner update uh, that America is in great need of such Kerner-generated soft power. Yet new soft power and new evidence-based policy cannot emerge 
without the new will that the original Kerner Commission said was necessary for progress. What is the use of evidence in our presently threatened democracy if there is no will to take action? Fifty years after the Kerner Commission, the creation of new will still is harder to achieve than ever. But we must begin. We are back to really, really to George Bernard Shaw. Some see things as they are and ask why. We must dream of things that never were and ask why not. In that devastating year of 1968, Martin Luther King asked why not. Before being assassinated, he was advocating a multi-racial economic justice coalition among the poor, the working class, and the middle class. As I recently suggested at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, where Dr. King was killed while supporting sanitation workers, creation of that King Economic Justice Coalition, which embraced the civil rights movement, needs to be the point of departure for the creation of new will in the 21st century. MacArthur Genius Award winner, Reverend uh, William Barber of North Carolina, can help lead the way. But his National uh, Poor People's Campaign against the immorality of poverty and inequality needs to be joined by many, many other well coordinated constituencies. Those Kerner constituencies include Americans who reject the culture of inward-looking selfishness begun in the 1980s and who, in President Kennedy's words, ask what they can do for their country. Those Kerner constituencies include Americans who reject the selfish admonition that you're on your own and who instead recognize that we're all in this together. Those Kerner constituencies include most of the 99% of us who have suffered the inequality, greed, and malfeasance of Wall Street. Those constituencies potentially include the 18 million white Americans who live in poverty. Why aren't they voting for Kerner priorities? Those constituencies include millennials who during the me recent midterm elections fin finally started to grow vote in greater numbers. And I think that Generation Z will do even better. Those constituencies include the LGBTQ movement and the women's movement. Those constituencies include the majority of Americans who want to keep immigration levels or to increase them. Those constituencies include teachers who have walked out of public schools demanding higher salaries and new textbooks. Those constituencies include the leaders of newly emerging initiatives to integrate schools that remain profoundly segregated beginning in New York City. Those constituencies include the high school students from Parkland, Florida, who, now inspired by the Prime Minister of New Zealand, have impressively organized and led the Never Again movement against gun violence, and who have begun to partner with Sandy Hook Promise, the Brady Campaign, and the Gifford Center. And those constituencies constituencies include citizens on the right and the left who just may be able to at least find some common ground, beginning with issues like less poverty for people of all races, infrastructure repair, expanded preschool, genuine community policing, more extensive criminal justice reform, and new global soft power. Crucially, the generation of new will must be facilitated by the creation of a fairer, more responsive American democracy. If the votes of all Americans were actually given equal weight, a new economic justice movement would have a better chance of reducing poverty, inequality, and racial injustice. That is why we must intensify the fight for campaign finance reform. We must intensify the fight for voting rights reform. We must intensify the fight for control of gerrymandering. And we must intensify the fight to abolish the Electoral College. Equally important, the generation of new will must be facilitated by reform of the media who were criticized uh, greatly by the Kerner Commission. The media need to hire more people of color. 
ownership of television stations by people of color needs to be significantly expanded. The media need to include much more coverage of what works, and it should be truly evidence-based. The media need to more honestly recognize that the real story is, in fact, dog bites man. That is, the real story, the real Kerner media story, is continuing every day poverty, inequality, and racial injustice. And we must take regulatory action against social media platforms and feedback loops that divide our society by pushing addicted users deeper and deeper into their own hermetically sealed bubbles. To a considerable extent, the movement for a new will and for a new economic justice alliance needs to emerge at the grassroots outside of government. But legislation and funding must build on good government at the local, state, and federal levels. It is fashionable uh, to advocate uh, for what some call the new localism, and we must encourage it, especially while our society remains so terribly divided. Yet we cannot give up on good federal government, however long it may take to return. Good government and Republican President Lincoln freed the slaves. Good government and Democratic President Roosevelt legislated the National Labor Relations Act, Social Security, and the bloodless revolution of the New Deal. Good government and Republican President Eisenhower built the interstate highway system. Good government and Democratic President Johnson secured the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Fair Housing Act. Good government now must invest in Kerner priorities at a scale equal to the dimensions of the problem. Investing to scale and creating new will should be evidence-based, but it should not be elitist. We must appeal to the hearts of Americans. We must appeal through tested and convincing messaging and through honest narratives about how real people benefit from what works. Now, in all of this, I challenge St. Anselm's College and the New Hampshire community in general to partner with us. For example, how can you, the college, respond to the failure of American universities to motivate students into new multiple solution programs that integrate Kerner policy analysis, training in, in how to evaluate for evidence, practice and how to communicate what works, and real world experience in grassroots advocacy. American universities now really need such new degree programming, I suggest. That programming needs to integrate knowledge and practice to reduce poverty and inequality. And this is especially needed now, given the college admission scandals swirling around schools like Stanford, Yale, and many others. We've been talking about this in a number of universities. More immediately than uh, the, the university issue, um, over the coming months, uh, you here in New Hampshire will host uh, all of the candidates uh, coming in. You've already hosted uh, uh, two, two or three, I believe, um, and uh, there are waves and waves about to uh, descend upon you. As you engage the uh, candidates, how can the faculty of this college how can the student body of this college and how can the New Hampshire community in general better spread the word on the lack of progress in reducing poverty, inequality, and racial injustice? I think you can. How can you motivate candidates to propose specific policy to reduce poverty, to reduce inequality, to reduce racial injustice? I'm not hearing too much from the candidates yet on that. How can you advocate for policy based on evidence, not ideology. And most importantly, how can you inject the need for new will into the presidential dialogue as we move forward towards 2020? As we hopefully jointly create that new will with you, I conclude by asking you never to forget how long the dream has been deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? 
Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Perhaps that dream just sags like a heavy load. Or does it just explode? Thank you.